I'm not a superstitious person. So You're so not a superstitious person, dude. I've really tried to go all spiritual and woo-woo on, on Julian, and he just doesn't get it. I'm like, Julian, can't you feel it? This is a sign. I'm like, he's like, mm, no. Ah! This is not your first time at the God's Country Rodeo. That's true. Um, I, I, I first read the story over a decade ago. It's based on a, sh a short story by James Lee Burke. First time I read it, I knew I was going to have to engage with it in, in some way. In 2014, I made a short film, which I think is what you're referring to. A short uh, was a pretty direct adaptation of the story, which is, you know, about an older white man living and working in Montana. You know, it's a very character-driven little story. I, I, I didn't think there was enough material there for a feature, so I thought that was going to be the end of it. You know, Shay and I, a couple of years later, you know, had this idea for a pretty radical reimagining of the story, and that's what led us here. It kind of sprung from a conversation where we wanted to talk, where we talked about making our activism, our art and our activism kind of align. And I got to give Julian credit. It was Julian's idea to shift this character to uh, a Black woman. Just changing that one character, you put that same character in that same story and make a lot of the choices, at least with the initial first act, the same, it still changes the movie just because of who is now at the center of it, the way people react to this woman making these decisions and making, making these choices. And once you made that change, it opened up the movie. It opened it up from, you know, just a kind of like a short story to like the world opened up because now we're looking at this outsider, you know, a legitimate, like you look at her and you see she's different from everything else in this world. And that for me as a, as a creative and like also aligning with my manifesto in terms of the, the stories that I want to tell, it really opened up the world for me and it gave us opportunities to like go beyond the original source material. How do you as an actor contain that, but also show that on screen when you have to contain it so much and hold it so back? Sylvia is not saying much mm. about the movie, but you're feeling something's going on. I'm actually not a, a fan of you have to be the thing in order to play the role, but I do recognize why that has happened in our industry. Representation in Hollywood of, of, of people has been incredibly frustrating for minorities. And I enjoy that, uh, that conversation, I do. I miss seeing actors change, like, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis or, mm. you know, Meryl Streep, some of our greatest technicians have, you know, require change is what makes them so brilliant, literally to play people other than themselves. And I have enjoyed that in my career very much, but I now accept that that will be limited because of the need for people to, to be represented. The reason I could do all that is because that's my life. She's named after Sandra Bland. And I didn't know that for a little while. I'd read the script, Julian and I had spoken. I can't remember when it came up, but I've been a human rights activist for, for very many years, decades. And for a good five, I've been supporting Kimberly Crenshaw's work with the African-American Policy Forum and movement to say her name, which she coined. And in this movie, right from the get-go, we are saying her name. And I not just, don't just mean just about Sandra Bland. I'm talking about all the Sandra Blands now, in the past, slavery, before that, you know. I'll tell you one thing, which is an actual, which is an actual truth. This this is my last movie as an actor. I don't think that's any big deal for anyone else, but it's certainly significant for me. And I went into it telling these guys, I didn't, want, I, I didn't think I could do it. I'd come off a long run of work and I just didn't think I could give to the movie. I absolutely fucking loved the script, but I knew that someone was going to make it fantastic. And it didn't need me. It needed just someone great. And I know for a fact that there are so many fucking amazing black actresses out there. And if you think there aren't, you're wrong. They're just waiting, waiting. And God damn it, I'm glad I can let this one go because someone's going to rock this shit and I can't wait to watch it. That's what I felt. Mm -hmm. And then I went away, did all the work I was doing, finished it. And I, I, a week after I was, you know, finished, I thought, my God, I wonder what's happened to that incredible movie. I wonder who's going to play the role because I still wanted to see it. And so I inquired my agent and it was still available. I oh, jumped like a fucking... Tiger on it. And Julian hadn't hadn't cast someone else. I was like, what the fuck's uh, wrong with you? And there was a good reason for that, I will say, which was when you and I first talked, it was so clear to me that you were the person. And when it couldn't happen for whatever reason, I 
I just kind of felt like that's not correct. That is not the outcome. That's not the right outcome. And, and that's just, not what filmmakers do, man. They're like, okay, fuck her, on to the next one. They don't invest in an actor. With this project, Shay and I, uh, and frankly, everyone, the producers, like everyone who's worked on it, we knew, you know, there were moments when things were in question and then something would happen. Like I would speak to Tanya for the first time and it was just so clear, like, oh, we can stop looking now. You have these, these iceberg tip moments where you have one conversation with someone and you know, you, you know so much about them, but it's not conscious yet. And then slowly you start to understand why that was the right decision. And it all makes so much sense. And that was the experience of working with Tandy Way for the last couple of years. Tandy Way, what was the, what was the toughest scene for you to shoot? In the forest. The reason it, it was most frightening, I was scared about it, is because I was like, how am I going to be this little lady? How am I going to be commanding in this scene? Funnily enough, that scene was we didn't get to do that till after the pandemic. So I had like a year being frightened of it. <laughs> Additional to the fear that I already had. And believe me, I was still frightened of it, but like it had really reached a pitch <laughs> by the time we came back. What's great about all of those scenes is you're expecting this outcome and then you just flip it. You were expecting something much different at that tree farm. That is the truth. It is the truth. And when you're, when you're saying you just flip it, it's not for the sake of flipping it. It's because it's the uncomfortable truth. And I think we're seeing that a lot. It's not just this movie. It's seeing how filmmakers are really, there's no more compromise. You know, truth is the most powerful commodity and trust is everything. In a traditional Western, like that scene, you know where that scene is going. You're waiting for blood. Your expectation is blood. Mm -hmm. And the whole back on that takes a lot of restraint. It takes a, a hand of, of creatives who like, or who trust what they're trying to say and what they're trying to do.